Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 18. 1 Samuel chapter 18. We looked at David, I mean, um, sorry, we looked at Saul in this chapter and the marks of a demon-possessed man, basically when the devil's influence in a man. But I want to concentrate this evening on Jonathan and the first four verses of the chapter and preach a little bit on brotherly love, which is kind of the opposite of what we looked at before. <laughs> um, David and Jonathan's relationship is the opposite of David and Saul's. I mean, the, it's almost extreme opposites with Saul and Jonathan. Which goes to show you, just because your lot in life allows you to be raised by a demon-possessed man, does not mean that you have to be one. You, you know, society is... Well, I was raised that way. That's no excuse for sin. Well, I never had a chance. Well, well, you just don't know where I came from. That's no excuse for sin. Sin is your choice and your downfall. It's never your parents, your countries, or your circumstances. It's your choice. And when somebody chooses sin, when they choose drugs, when they choose alcohol, when they choose these kind of lifestyles, it has nothing to do with how they race. Now, I understand we look at some people and we say they ain't got a chance in the world. Which, there's a certain amount of truth to that. When somebody's exposed to something too much, they're more likely to fall. And you, you start dealing with some of the inner city kids. I mean, they do have everything stacked against them. But when it comes to the great white throne judgment, they give account of their actions. And it's what they did. And it's how they sinned against their conscience and how they ignored the truth when it was presented to them. Because it, it, the buck stops with your decision. So Jonathan, he could have followed in the footsteps of Saul his father. But he doesn't. He doesn't. And Jonathan is quite the character. Now, uh, let's look in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18 and read 1 through 4. And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and let him go no more home to his father's house, then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him. He literally gave him his shirt off his back. And gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and his bow and to his girdle. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I pray that you'll be with this message. I pray that we will take and uh, have a better understanding from Jonathan's life of what true love is with brotherly love and not this false stuff that the world presents, but learning how to love one another in a biblical way and the way that you would have us. And I pray that we'll take it to our hearts. I pray that you will make us Christians that understand the principle of love and that we apply it to our life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now if you also will go with me to 2 Samuel chapter 1 and see what David says about Jonathan at the end of his life. When Jonathan dies, David is lamenting Jonathan. And in 2 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 25 through 26, this is David's opinion of Jonathan. How art the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle, O Jonathan? 
Thou wast slain in thine high places. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. In other words, this love was a brotherly love. He calls Jonathan his brother. Uh, now this is not what the world would have it be. He says, passing the love of women, not the love like what a woman gets. All right? So it's different. I mean, you got, I mean, we were talking a little bit about sodomy earlier. Uh, this ain't a fruitcake love. It's not a sodomite love. Okay? This is a true love between two friends. Brotherly love. And uh, when we're supposed to have Christian love, it's a brotherly love. It's not a fleshly love. That has to do with lust. A lot of things, what people call love these days, is actually lust, lasciviousness, or wickedness. Okay? Now, I understand there's an intimate love between a man and a wife, but that belongs between a man and a wife, and they're only. Outside that, it's a brotherly love. And that love can be very strong. And it should be. It should be. And we should learn how to love one another. Uh, Jesus Christ gives two commandments. Take your Bible and turn to uh, Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. We're told two commandments here. Matthew 22. And look at verse 39. Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine. 39. Well, let's get the first one. Let's get uh, let's go up and get the context. Look at verse thirty-six. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it: Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So, loving one another is something that the Lord wants you to learn how to do, right? That's His second commandment. He wants you to love Him with all His heart. But He also wants you to learn to love one another. There's nothing wrong with that. Matter of fact, that is something you should learn to do. You say, that comes naturally? No, it doesn't. It does not come naturally. It's something you have to work on. You have to learn how to love. You got to learn how to do that. Uh, there's nothing natural about that. Here, Jonathan loves in that way, loves his neighbor as himself, says they love David as his own soul in the passage. So he loved him as himself. Jonathan fulfills that. So if we want to study how to do that, we all study Jonathan's love for David. That's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to study Jonathan's love for David. Uh, he loved him as himself. And, you know, there is, um, there's one, another time where Jesus Christ gives the commandment, but he says it a little bit different. And it's a little even stronger yet. Go to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I punish myself a lot. You know that? If I loved you like I love myself, you may not want my love. <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, that's, but look at John, uh, John 15, 12. John 15, 12. This, this is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. Now let me tell you something. Would you rather me love you like Christ loved you or love you like I love myself? I already told you, I punish myself. I, I'm kind of harsh on myself sometimes. So that's a little bit stronger there. Uh, Christ's love is the purest love you can find. And it's going to be the strongest love. Now... When it comes to loving the brethren, Jonathan loved David as his own soul. His love was very strong. And it's 
strong like the Lord's love toward us. Now, the Lord loved us enough to die for us, right? The Bible says, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay? So he loved us strong enough to die for us even when we were sinners. Yet sinners, Christ died for us. Matter of fact, in the same passage, we're called enemies of God. While we were enemies of him, he died for us. Okay, so that's quite a strong love. Now, what we find with Jonathan is Jonathan is also willing to put himself in harm's way because of his love for David. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 20. 1 Samuel chapter 20. So it's a sacrificial love. It's one where he loves him enough to die for him or put himself in harm's way. 1 Samuel chapter 20. And look at verse 32. And Jonathan answered Saul his father and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? So he's arguing with Saul. And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him, whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. So uh, Jonathan puts himself between David and Saul here. He's being the intercessor, and he's dealing with Saul for David. You know what he did? He put his life at risk. He went against the king's will. And this king was demon-possessed. <laughs> I mean, he throws a javelin at his own son. Okay? Now, I'm not sure if Jonathan knew that that would happen, but the point is, is he's in harm's way. Okay? Now, Jesus Christ loved us enough to die for us. Jonathan loves David enough to put himself in harm's way. The Bible says that um, there's no greater love than that one will lay down his life for his friend. Okay? So, if you're going to have a love that's strong the way... Jesus Christ is commanding it, it's got to be a love strong enough to where you'll put yourself in harm's way. You're willing to lay your life down for him. Now, how many, we'll look around the room, how many other people here would you die for? I mean, it, it, does that reality hit? I mean, yeah, I'd easily die for my kids. I love them. Oh, man, I don't know. Oh, you. <laughs> you, know, it's a, oh my God. You, you know what I'm saying here. I mean, I, I went out hunting with a brother one time, and we were bear hunting, and he's about this tall, this wide. And brother O'Malley, man, you, some of y'all knew. This guy's big. And we're out in the middle of nowhere, way, way up in the South Fork. I said, brother, you get mauled by a bear. I'm just putting you out of misery. No way I'm going to haul you out of here. <laughs> what does a guy do? He wounds a bear and we just about get mauled by a bear. <laughs> I, mean, I, I had to bail him out of the situation there. But uh, anyways, the bear died. He lived. But I mean... But he came close. He came close. He said, are you willing to put yourself in harm's way? Now, when it comes to that, I've always been the one that was willing to be the first one out on it. I'm not going to let somebody else go into the dangerous position. It's in your nature to put yourself in the foremost of danger. That should be your nature. You should make it Part of your nature. You, you, you know these guys in the military, you hear about a guy jumping on a uh, grenade to save his buddies. You know why he does not Not because he makes a calculated thought. There's no way he has time. It has to be in his character and nature to do that. that ha he has to love, already go through his mind, and that's, the Marines will call it a band of brothers. So the brotherly love is, I'm going to give my life for my companion. That's in their nature. And uh, that's why they do it. You know, the Christian life is like a warfare. 
we all learn something from the Marines. They're a band of brothers. It ought to be in your nature to be willing to love your brother enough to die for him. That's a Christian love. That's what the Lord's telling you. To love one another as yourself. Or to love them as He loved them. He, was, he showed us that love. We should have that ourselves. Willing to die. So he was willing to put himself in harm's way. John also, Jonathan also loved him enough to think of no evil of him. Now a lot of Christians fell at this one. <laughs> think no evil. Look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 20. We're here. Uh, the argument between um, Saul and David. Look at verse uh, 32. 20 verse 32. And Jonathan answered Saul his father and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? Now, uh, Saul wants to slay, slay David because he knows David's been anointed by God. There's a jealousy factor there. Guess what? Jonathan knows this too. Matter of fact, he knows that David is going to take the king. No. Which, by inheritance, it should be Jonathan's. Yet Jonathan's fine with David taking it. I, that's, that's quite something else. He's putting David way before himself here. And if anybody should be converted to Saul's position to be against David, it should have been Jonathan. He had the most to gain to go against David. Yet Jonathan says, nope. I love him. I'm not going to go against him. He won't think any evil. Now, you know why many times somebody thinks evil of somebody else? For self-preservation to make oneself look better. That's, what, that's the reason it happens most of the time. And that's what Jonathan could have done, but he doesn't. Now, that's a truest form of love, take your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now this chapter is on charity. Now many of the new versions will change the word to love because it could be translated that way. King James Bible left as charity, which it should be. What is charity? Charity is a love that's given without any expectation of something in return. That's what it is. It is a love, but it's a certain type of love. It's a giving love. That's why we say, give charity. We're giving something. I mean, do you expect the poor orphans in Africa to give you anything back when you give charity? No. So, you have compassion and love, you give something, and you do not expect anything in return. That's what charity is. Now, when the Bible's describing some things about charity, look what it says. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Look at verse 5. Well, let's get verse 4 and 5. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity, what? Envieth not. Okay? Yeah, so a lot of times when you go against somebody, it's because you envy them and it's going to benefit you if you go against them. Okay, envy if not, charity, vaunt if not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own. Get yeah, ideals kind of describe it, Jonathan here. Okay, this is the kind of character Jonathan had. Is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. You know what Jonathan had? He had a love for David that you could describe as a charity. It's the same description that charity is given here. It's the same description. He loved himself enough to not think any evil of them. Now, now you know what a Baptist does? 
First time they hear some juicy bit of gossip, they believe it and spread it. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's typical among Christians. Shouldn't be that way. It should be when you hear it, like, that may be true, but I just cannot believe that. You say, well, that's just being naive. No, it may be just because you love them. You don't want to believe something bad about them until it's proven. Now, being naive is knowing they're capable of it. Every person is capable of any sin. Now, that's not being naive. Okay? Every person is capable. But when you love something, you don't quickly believe it. You don't quickly believe it. In other words, you give them the benefit of the doubt. You're looking for a reason to justify them. You're looking for a reason to say, no, uh, a good thing to say, well, where's your evidence and where's your proof of that? Well, I heard that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, I'll back out. You know, I'll back out. I heard, you hear a lot of things that's not so. I mean, all you have to do is turn on CBN and that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I better just dodge that one. <laughs> he uh, thinks no evil. You know, that's the way we all be among as Christians. We shouldn't quickly think evil one of another. And uh, you, you know what somebody that quickly thinks evil of them? They jump on any suspicion as fact. That's what they do. And there's people that make a habit of it. They run with it before they find out the details. Uh, and it may look a certain way, but when you find out the details, you might find out that it's not quite the way you thought it was. And, uh, and there is a caution to saying, okay, you have this, 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 and stack. There may be a problem here. But you don't go running around spreading it. You don't go jump on that man. If everybody had charity that thought no evil, gossiping would die. It would in the church. Uh, and, and that's that's why you know we're all guilty of it. I know you are. I know nature enough to know you're all guilty. But you know what that shows you? That shows you that you have not learned brother, brotherly love the way you should. And that's your problem. That's your problem. That's something you need to work on. Number four. John's love was a giving love. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 18. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 4. i got to get back to 1 Samuel here. 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 4. It says, And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. Now, now here's the truth. You can give without loving but you cannot love without giving. If you love somebody, you're going to give. And you'll give. And that's why the Lord says, God loveth a cheerful giver. It doesn't mean you love the church. It means you love your Lord. If you love the Lord, you don't have to be asked to give. You know, one thing I don't do is I don't pass a plate. It's right there. If you love the Lord, you can give to Him. It's between you and Him. And uh, that's as far as I go with that thing. But it has to do with giving has to do with love. Now, sometimes people give to get selfish motive. And uh, sometimes marriages start that way. It's a marriage of lust. They're giving to get. It doesn't last. It doesn't last. You know what love is? Love is a choice. Say, I fell in love. No, I chose to love. 
Do you think God just fell in love enough to die for you? No, He chose to love. You know why you love Him? Because you choose to. You choose to receive Jesus Christ. You know why you stay with your wife your entire life? Because you choose to. Say, I fell in love. Then you'll fall out of love. If you fell in, you'll fall out. If you choose and follow through with your choice, it will last. Because the choice does not have nothing to do with them. It has to do with you following through with a character. Now, you see that? Say, well, my wife doesn't look as pretty as she used to. I mean, you never did look pretty. <laughs> my, my, my wife doesn't do, do, treat me. Uh, she doesn't cook the, for me in the morning anymore. She doesn't do this. She doesn't do that. So, you chose to love her. You chose. You love her as she is. You, you know what real love is? You love somebody as they are, not as you want them to be. Because you choose. You, because you know what they are? Not the same thing they'll be in ten years. Everybody changes through time. Everybody changes through time. So you know what you have to do? You have to follow the choice. If you fall in love with your wife when you're 20, will you still love her when she's 40? She will not be the same person. You're not even the same person. Nobody's the same person 20 years down the road. Time changes people. That's the truth of it. So it has to be a choice. Jonathan's love was a giving love. You know what the love between a man and a wife should be? One where you give yourself completely to them. You say, what is it? It's 100%. It's 200%. 100% one person, 100% the other. And if it's not, it doesn't last. It may be 100% one person, 50% the other. It'll wind up in a divorce. It takes two to keep a marriage together. It takes two. I, I've seen, I think, I always say this, and I do somewhat believe this because we're sinners. I think every divorce is a percentage of the fault of both parties. It's just sometimes the percentage is much higher on one side <laughs> than the other. But I think there is a percentage. If there wasn't a percentage, then you'd be a perfect person. And I know that ain't the case. But the thing is, is that everybody is putting their full into it, then the marriage will stay together. Which is the way it should be. The way it should be. You should never go into a marriage thinking that it will ever end. Right. It'll all be a forever thing. Period. And uh, that's, that's the way... What is that? That's a choice. It's a choice. It requires giving. It requires a giving love. Now, Lord Jesus Christ knows something about giving. Have you ever thought about it? Is there anything you can give God that He actually needs? What does He need? So do you think He's given you love to get something from you? Now, if you there's, there's only one thing that you can give Him that He wants. Honor and glory. Honor and glory. But He'll get that with or without you. He'll get it with or without you was a giving love. Jonathan's love was not for self-preservation. We kind of already looked at that. Uh, Saul's arguing with him in 1 Samuel 20, 31. He says, uh, For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. Wherefore now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. So that was Saul's argument. Hey, if you're going to preserve yourself, 
you better go get them. Well, so, uh, Jonathan's love wasn't for self-preservation. And, uh, you know, many a times when we examine our love for somebody, there's an element of what do I get from it? How does it benefit me? Even in a marriage, a lot of times our motivation of love, there is something that we're expecting in return. And to love somebody without expecting anything in return, no preservation of oneself would be a completely unselfish love. Well, that's a little hard to do. And if you really, truly was honest with yourself, you say, how much do I love that person? Do I love them enough where I expect nothing from them? Nothing from them. I'll give them this, I'll do this for them, I'll give them the shirt off my back, I'll die for them, I'll take and uh, put them before myself, and I expect nothing for myself from this. Nothing at all. It's just what I can do for them. That is where you've actually learned how to love like Christ. But boy, I'll tell you, that goes completely 100% against your nature. You are not naturally that way. The only way you're going to wind up that way is if you study the Lord Jesus Christ enough and try to be like Him. And the only way you're going to have that kind of love one toward another is if you follow His commandment that you love each other as He loved you. As He loved you. And... Uh, it doesn't come naturally. It doesn't come naturally. The world knows nothing about that kind of love. Uh, matter of fact, even in uh, marriages, they don't know anything about that kind of love. No, all marriage is about what... Uh, I'm going to marry her because she's so beautiful. And I'll enjoy her. That's lust. That's lust. But you know, that's... What does she look like? That's the first thing that crosses every person's mind before they get married. <laughs> or at least a man's. Thank God a woman doesn't think that way. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's, uh, but, uh, but, you know, that's, that's kind of... How well can he provide for me? There's the woman. Will he tell me what I want to hear? <laughs> and, you know, that's... <laughs> yeah, you know, that's in our nature. That's in our nature and marriages. But, all right, as you've been married for a while, you've made that choice, are you to a point where you'll love them whether they can ever give you anything back or not? How does a marriage last when somebody is so sick that they can't even walk or talk and they're basically just a vegetable, yet the spouse takes care of them for 20 years? That's a person that's learned how to love. That's a person that's learned how to love. Alright, so there's some lessons from Jonathan on how we should love one another.